Thank you all so much uh, for being with us today uh, for this post Mardi Gras wrap up press conference. Uh, we have with us Deputy Mayors Copeland, Morse, Sneed, Thomas, uh, Grant, and Arata, uh, Chief Ronald Surpass, Chief Parent, uh, Dr. Elder from EMS, uh, Colonel Mike Edmondson from the State Police, Sheriff Marlon Guzman is with us. Sheriff, thank you so much. Uh, if the car met from the airport, uh, Bill Salomon and Kay Wilkins from the American Red Cross. Uh, Mark Jernigan from Public Works, uh, the Sanitation Department, Park and Parkways, the Bureau of Revenue. Uh, Sonny Boray of the Mayor's uh, Advisory Council will be joining us shortly. Mark Romick uh, of the Tourism and Marketing Board. Uh, Kelly Schultz with the CVB uh, and other individuals that were part of the incredible partnership uh, that put on this Mardi Gras. I mean, simply stated, uh, the Mardi Gras of 2012 rocked. <laughs> it was... It, it did. It was a major success and I think a, a joyous occasion uh, for uh, almost uh, uh, all who attended. Um, by all indications, it was one of the biggest and the best. Uh, it's worth being uh, very humble about uh, why this was so. First of all, I want to thank the good Lord uh, for the, just the incredible weather. Uh, it was really a spectacular weekend. Uh, we had a small hiccup uh, on Saturday, almost identical to the problem that we had the year before, amazingly so, um, with Iris. But uh, we were very um, uh, ready to quickly adjust to that schedule, uh, which caused us to have what they call a monster day on Sunday, beginning at 9 o'clock. Uh, so that, that had a lot to do with it. The second part of it that I, d I don't want to go uh, unrecognized was uh, the extraordinary level of common sense uh, common courtesy, common safety, and personal responsibility uh, by all of the parade goers. This is really the driving force behind whether Mardi Gras is safe or not. Uh, if, if folks don't act right, uh, if they don't have common courtesy, uh, if they don't have personal responsibility, it makes it that much more difficult. And I just want to thank uh, all of the people of New Orleans particularly uh, and all of our guests for acting in a way that allowed Mardi Gras to be a great joy for so many of us that had the opportunity uh, to be part of it. Uh, just just a, a quick couple of notes. First of all, the economic impact of Mardi Gras, as you know, is huge. This city uh, is in the business of sports and cultural entertainment. It is one of the things that we do better than anybody else in the world. You have seen since Thanksgiving uh, and before Mardi Gras, the city hosts the largest number of sports and cultural events of any city in America. They don't even try to do what it is that we did. And then we took a small break. Uh, we got to watch somebody else be in the Super Bowl, which I hope we do for the last time in a long time. Uh, and then we started to prepare for not Mardi Gras, as I was reminded, but the carnival season, uh, which is a very long season. Uh, and it is an incredible economic impact. Last year, uh, the 10 days of events pumped over $300 million into the city's economy. Uh, although we don't have the final numbers yet, we expect that number to be bigger. Uh, according to the Convention and Visitors Bureau that's here today, uh, the city's 38,000 hotel rooms were nearly all full at a 97% occupancy level. That's a historic number, uh, and it uh, in, is incredible. Uh, all but two parades began within 20 minutes of the scheduled start time, uh, and you also know uh, this year you were able to see a number of different uh, very famous people joined us at Gallia Hall. Uh, Will Farrell was with us, Jesse Eisenberg, Mark Ruffalo, Mariska Hag Hargitay, Hilary Swank, Daryl Hanna, Cameron Mannheim, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, and I would like to just report to you that the first quarter numbers are in uh, on the film industry, and there's a reason why we hosted them, because New Orleans, again, has become an international competitor in the film industry. As we stand here today, there are only two places in America that produce more films than us now, uh, and it's Los Angeles and it's New York. $500 million book of business last year, uh, and we think that we're going to outpace that uh, this year as well. So we were very happy to host them. One of the reasons we had them here was to uh, remind them how important they were uh, to us uh, and, and to be very thankful for uh, all of the work that they had done. They were also joined by uh, Isla Fisher, Brooke Shields, David Morris, Wendell Pierce, and, of course, Andy Garcia had so much fun uh, that he came back this year again. Uh, so we're very thankful to have them as well. As a matter of public safety, uh, again, I said that uh, it's very, very helpful when everybody uses common sense and common courtesy. It takes a huge amount of pressure off of the law enforcement folks that are doing uh, an unbelievable job. But I think, as everybody can attest, 
there was a robust presence uh, on the streets with visibility, uh, with all of the new vest, uh, we, were, we were everywhere. Uh, over 115,000 man hours uh, were spent by public safety this carnival season. I'll give you a couple of preliminary uh, reports. Fewer crimes were, were committed this year as compared to 2011. Uh, the chief can talk a little bit more about this, but there was a 9% reduction in reported crimes against persons uh, versus the 2011 numbers, a 6% reduction in reported property crimes. Uh, the 8th District, uh, which uh, re uh, reported 40%, 44% reduction in reported crimes uh, against persons, 84% uh, increase in the number of summonses that were issued, 193 curfew arrests, uh, including 55 during the new hours, 33 gun arrests, including 22 confiscated weapons in the 8th District. Uh, and, I, and I hope that you all noticed uh, that the NOPD, uh, with all of our partners, responded uh, to all of these incidences with urgency, and they got there exactly when they needed to. Uh, we worked very, very well this year with the Mardi Gras Indians. As you know, we spent a lot of time working with them uh, moving up to Mardi Gras. They're a really important part of our tradition. Uh, yesterday, I was able to leave Gallia Hall uh, for a moment and go down to the Seventh Ward uh, and to be with Darrell Montana and the Yellow Pocahontas uh, tribe. It was just an amazing experience, and I thank them for allowing me uh, to participate with them in that short way. Uh, EMS, of course, is a very critical part of what we do. They responded to 2,024 calls, uh, an amazing amount of work uh, for that organization, and, and I thank them for, the, for what they've done. The American Red Cross, always an incredible partner. Okay, you, 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 your team is just spectacular. Uh, they had 150 volunteers. They handled six, 690 patient encounters. Only 39 of them were referred to EMS, which means they were handling most of that stuff on site. And uh, if any of you have been able to move around the parade routes, you know that the Red Cross is, is all over, and they do a great job. The fire department, of course, uh, hundreds of inspections uh, for the vendor trucks, the floats, the flambeau, and the viewing stands. Those things don't just happen by accident. The fire department was out there doing their job, and I appreciate it. The sheriff's office provided public safety and cleanup support, including mobile booking center in the French Quarter, which, again, sheriff worked spectacularly well this year, so I thank you for that. Uh, the Department of Bureau and Revenue, uh, you know, all these folks out there are not out there just on their own. They're all permitted. And the Department of Bureau of Revenue handles that. They performed 1,035 permit uh, and license checks. Uh, the total of 121 violations were issued uh, to make sure that people were paying what they were supposed to. Uh, so the taxpayers were getting their value. Uh, and, of course, we work with the cultural community again. Uh, to avoid the hiccups that we had in past Mardi Gras when people didn't know what kind of permits they actually needed. Uh, Public Works uh, did an unbelievable job. They towed over 700 parked cars along the parade route. You'll recall that uh, a couple of weeks before Mardi Gras, I told people to mind their P's and Q's that one of the things that was part of Common Curtis was not parking in people's driveways, uh, making sure that you didn't park on the neutral grounds where you weren't supposed to. Uh, they, they issued 1,045 neutral ground uh, violations and so they were out making sure that the streets were streets were passable uh, and that they were safe and I thank them for the work that they did now to my favorite part of this whole story uh, and I talk a lot about this that people see the front of the house side uh, you come you come with your children uh, you put your ladder up hopefully you catch some beads without stepping on anybody else's fingers and then you go home uh, and I like to talk about the back of the house side of Mardi Gras uh, because that is where the extraordinary amount of work is done. It takes thousands of employees to make this work. And the best part of Mardi Gras is when the parade ends and the cleanup starts. For those of you that ever spent your time as a child watching all those trucks go by, uh, and I want to tell you that uh, it was just an extraordinary effort. Deputy Mayor Moore, is standing, Thomas, standing to my right, uh, is the Deputy Mayor of Operations, and she led this uh, particular effort along with the Deputy Mayor of Public Safety, Jerry Sneed. Uh, we had to clean up after 32 parades. Um, up to 465 workers were cleaning around the clock. So as you may recall, uh, Sunday was a marathon day. Uh, it was a long day. Uh, and it didn't start until after we cleaned up from Endymion. So Endymion ended at about 11.52, and the streets of New Orleans were cleaned by about 2.30. Now, that's an amazing thing. And then we started on Sunday morning. Had a monster day, right, finished with Bacchus. And then the streets had to be cleaned for Monday morning because, again, you remember Tux ran, rode at uh, 3 o'clock. And so we had Tux, then we had Proteus, 
Then we had Orpheus that night. And then when Orpheus stopped, the streets had to be cleaned by 7 o'clock in the morning. And our folks worked around the clock. And I want to I wanna just really commend them for that. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that in this organization, we all go to the ball. Uh, we all cross train. So every department never get allow, is allowed to stay in their own silos. If they have extra folks, they're all called in to help. And it was a team effort. And so I want to acknowledge sanitation, park and parkways, NORD. I want to announce code enforcement and property management, public works, sewage and water board, the equipment's maintenance division, the, the firefighters, everybody uh, was called to this task. And it was also accomplished with support from the downtown development district. Sheriff, Sheriff Guzman was always available. Uh, and on call when needed, and our contract is Metro, Richards, STT, and so many temporary uh, workers were there to help us uh, with all of this. So uh, I want to thank everybody. It was a monumental effort. Uh, again, uh, I want to one more time recognize the East and the West Bank captains uh, and the crews, of course, because Mardi Gras wouldn't be possible without the work that they've done. It is the greatest free show on earth. The marching bands, the float builders, the truck drivers, the thousands of employees, uh, and the residents and visitors, visitors uh, everybody in New Orleans has acquitted themselves once again uh, extraordinarily well. The whole world was watching, and I think the story they saw about New Orleans, again, uh, was a great symbol of a, of a city uh, that continues to be uh, the story of resurrection and redemption, coming from the worst that America has seen in a long time to time and time and time again. Uh, from the announcements last uh, week of GE bringing 300 jobs here, uh, to, again, the greatest cultural show on earth uh, that the city of New Orleans uh, has made a decision that she's going to come back, uh, she's going to be better than she was before, and she's going to dream about the city that she wants to become. And I think this, uh, again, showed that the people of New Orleans are ready uh, and are up to that challenge. So uh, I thank you all for that. I'd like to call Chief Surpass and then Sheriff Guzman, Colonel Mike Edmondson, uh, Deputy Mayor Thomas, Mark Romy, uh, and then we'll take questions after that. Chief Surpass. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, you know, certainly when you work for someone, you pay very close to their instructions. And the whole idea of cross-training is important for you to know because last year we cross-trained the mayor to ride a horse during the daytime. <laughs> this year we've cross-trained him to ride a horse at night. Next year there's no telling where he may ride a horse. <laughs> so we want to thank the mayor. We want to thank Sheriff Guzman, Colonel Edmondson, Butch Browning, our state fire marshal, the alcohol, tobacco, and control folks, and well as Warden Burl Kane, whose DOC officers come and do the daytime closures in the French Quarter traditionally for many, many years. The men and women of this department delivered, folks. They delivered. In my mind, after 32 years of policing and 24 Mardi Gras or 23 Mardi Gras, I have never seen a group of men and women respond as quickly, as professionally, and as promptly as they did with the weather issues and two other things that we'll talk about briefly. In 2012, this was this police department's year to negotiate. We did a lot of negotiating this year. The first thing we had to do was negotiate the weather. And in doing so, we met with the crew captains on Thursday and Friday before the big weekend. We're told that's never happened before, where all the crew captains was brought to headquarters. And we sat down and we hammered out a deal. What is it we can do to get every one of these parades on the street? What is it we can do to get every one of these officers prepared and as rested as they possibly can be? And what does it take to move all these floats, all these tractors, all these riders, all these crews, and to do that starting on Endemion Saturday and Orpheus starting within minutes of its normal time and finishing three days later? I've got to tell you, I've never been as impressed with a large police organization as I was during this last weekend. We negotiated with the Mardi Gras Indians. They had issues that had been unresolved for far too many years by the police department, and we made a commitment to change our practices, and we did. As a result of changing those practices, we gave new instructions to the officers, and as, as we speak now, we have reason to believe that the instructions were followed, and we still have one or two items to look into to make sure, but this police department changed its practices with the Indians, and I think we had a success. We also had another negotiation, which wasn't much of a negotiation because Councilmember Clarkson grabbed me by the back of my head and said, we got to get some relief on the West Bank. We need some extra blocks on the West Bank parades that we've lost since Katrina. And because of our partnership with Councilmember Clarkson and the West Bank crews and their captains and their teams and the Louisiana State Police, we were able to add the three blocks this year to give the West Bank crews that traditionally take the De Gaulle route a bit more of the area that they wanted to police, or wanted to parade. Algiers. Of Algiers. What I said, the West Bank? Mm -hmm. Algiers ain't on the West Bank? <laughs> but it's the best West Bank. <laughs> In other words, we negotiated three major items this year. And I think the police department did an incredible job, and we should continue to do so. 
The Mardi Gras season resulted in about a 6% increase in the numbers of hours officers was on the field. We went out there and had to work a little more. We believe we're within the budget for the Mardi Gras overtime. We won't know for sure for about two more weeks, but we believe we will be on budget and potentially under budget. There were about 114,000 hours of police officers on the field with about 42,000 of those hours in overtime. Curfew. We really took that serious this year, and I want to thank Commander Walls and his teams because the curfew arrests were up significantly, over fourfold. And 193 kids picked up for curfew compared to 38 last year. And 55 of those kids, or 28 percent, were picked up during the new hours. So we're beginning to see the value of our officers using a tool, and that tool is to help make children safe. We had an increase in arrests this year, and we also had an increase in summonses because we clearly hear the message that some revelry during Mardi Gras is acceptable, but some impedes the rights of others to enjoy their time with their families, and we will not uh, ignore those. So we did see an increase in arrests, but we also saw an increase in the use of summons. Remember, summons is the way for us to hold people responsible for an illegal action without having to take them to the jail. We issued 385 summons this year versus 209 last year, or an 84 percent increase. Guns. We look for guns every day, all day, any day. Our members on the parade route found 11 guns this year, led mostly by the 6th District, Commander Bob Barty and his team doing some important behind-the-scenes work. Uh, I was able to share their strategy with Colonel Sneed after he pointed out he didn't think the strategy was there, and I was able to deliver four arrests within a few minutes. The strategy was there. Our team does a very good job of looking for guns. The 8th District also picked up its gun arrests from last year. So throughout the entire Mardi Gras season, we ended up with 33 guns being taken off the streets. Drug arrests. Drug arrests participate in many other crimes, many other crimes of violence, and our drug arrests this year jumped over 200 percent. The drug arrests in the 8th District were 45 cases this year compared to 18 last year, and our parade route personnel added an additional 30 to those. As the mayor pointed out, citywide, the call demand to our police department, outside of the French Quarter, the city itself, we saw a total reduction during the same 11-day period, period this year, last year. Violent crimes were down 9 percent in the city across the city, and we think in the French Quarter, preliminary data, violent crimes down about 40, 44 percent this year over last year. At the end of the day, the men and women of this department proved unquestionably, without failing, that they are the very best in the world at managing large crowds, managing large crowds of people who come here to have a very good time, and then the issues that come up with logistics and moving parades around. So, Mr. Mayor, your team delivered. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I also want to uh, echo what the chief said. Uh, arrests were up this year uh, in the French Quarter where we had our mobile booking station. Uh, we actually had less arrests. Uh, we had 16 taken to the mobile booking as opposed to 45 last year. Uh, overall, uh, Mardi Gras was very safe uh, for the sheriff's office. Uh, we assisted with uh, 11 mounted officers patrolling the French Quarter along the parade route on St. Charles Avenue, and we also were, of course, in several parades uh, ensuring public safety. We had, as part of the crew of trash, uh, <laughs> 24 the deputies, the crew of clean. <laughs> we had 24 deputies along with uh, 40 community service inmates uh, clean up after 22 parades, uh, providing um, over 2,000 hours of community service hours. And of course, uh, Mayor, we were at Gallier Hall, uh, the Palace Guard, <laughs> uh, providing safety and security there. Uh, so over and all, all in all, Mardi Gras was great. That's terrific. Colonel Edmondson. Uh, four years ago, when I was appointed <laughs> superintendent of state police, my commitment was, was pretty simple in visiting with the governor. Become a part of the community of New Orleans, not apart from it. And as we start this next four years, I will continue to be a part of the community of, of New Orleans. I think the, the gauntlet was placed last night at about 11.45 when, when the mayor showed up as we walked a final route uh, and closed Mardi Gras with Chief Serpaz and all the men and women of the police department, the sheriff's office, and the state police. That had never been done before where a mayor showed up and made that final walk with us. I think that solidifies what this uh, administration feels about public safety. 33 weapons, that's 33 chances for violent behavior to happen somewhere in and around the French Quarter area. State police is committed to being part of it. It didn't just start with this, it won't end with this. We'll be here for the Final Four, we're here for Jazz Fest, we're for French Quarter Fest, we're here, we prepare for, the, uh, for next year's Super Bowl. We're a part of the community. Every single day there's men and women in the police department 
uh, of the state police that's working with the New Orleans Police Department in many different capacities, both plain clothes, undercover, and in uniform, to make sure this safe, the city is as safe as possible. Uh, I've said this before, but it bears repeating. When people come from all over the world and all over this country to be here, it's not about the color of our uniform. It's not about the shape of our badge. It's about that we're here for one single cause, and that's the safety of the people that want to be here. And, and that's where we stand for with state police, because that's what it needs to happen in New Orleans. Uh, we, Mayor, Chief, um, my hands go to the men and women that make up public safety in this department in this city. Uh, I was proud to be a part of it, and certainly uh, will continue to be part of the, uh, the surface and structure and uh, within the city of New Orleans. So thank you very much. Two weeks ago when uh, we had a press conference talking about um, Mardi Gras and uh, asking everyone to work with us, we made a commitment that within three hours of the end of each parade that we would have our streets cleaned and returned to normal. And with the exception of the Super Day um, Sunday where we had six parades um, because of the rain on Saturday and of course yesterday, we exceeded that goal. On average, um, our streets were clean uh, within two hours of each parade uh, throughout the, the carnival season. And that was only due to the cooperation of so many different agencies that came together um, to help make this effort happen. We made some adjustments with uh, equipment um, and people uh, and continued to be nimble as the weather changed and as um, the crowds grew um, or diminished, but we were able to, to do it all together. The mayor um, mentioned all the departments that were involved. They were quite a few. Uh, it really was uh, a, a multi-agency uh, effort um, that was uh, just amazing in, in its uh, implementation. But the, to me, the biggest thanks goes to the 465 men and women who were on that street every single day in the rain, in the cold, uh, when the weather was nice, uh, making sure that we worked as hard as we could to get it uh, back to normal as quickly as possible. So I would like to extend a very special thank you to every man and woman who worked on the streets this weekend, every equipment operator, every laborer, um, everyone who uh, did their part, and to the community. Because as I was walking around and driving around um, this weekend, I noticed that if there were a waste receptacle nearby, the average reveler would take their waste and put it in the, in the receptacle. We asked you to help us out with that, and you did, and so we thank you for that as well. Thank you, Representative. Oh, Jackie, would you like to take a question? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, I'd like to thank, first of all, you and your immediate executive staff because the dignity and decorum that was brought back to the uh, Palace Guard, back to the uh, Gallia Hall, and no fun of festivity was jeopardized to do that was remarkable. And that's a real Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And the public safety and the city workers out on the streets were phenomenal. Uh, Deputy Mayor Thomas, it was one hour cleanup in Algiers. Mm -hmm. And we heard more raves about that than the floats. So thank you very much. That was phenomenal. But I'd like to also thank my council, for our council, for I'm very territorial for all the cooperation that they gave and the things that they did building up to Mardi Gras. I want to thank uh, uh, Susan Guidry, District A, that's here for her work with the Mardi Gras Indians prior to Mardi Gras. I want to thank Kristen Palmer for her uh, ordinance on the curfew. And many things like that were done from the council level with the administration to make all of this happen. Thank you all. We're one great team for a great city. Mayor. Um, yes, we, we want to say that what the administration and all of the workers, uh, City Hall workers, with what they did for Mardi Gras 2012 is just spectacular. And um, I particularly would like to state that it appears from reports that I'm getting that the uh, New Orleans Police Department and the Mardi Gras Indians are doing uh, an incredible job of communicating and working together and respecting uh, the, the obligations that both have 
uh, around this time of year, one to uphold an incredible tradition and the other to uphold public safety. And uh, that communication is all that we need to have this work. And that is happening now, and we're very excited about that. I also want to thank everyone who had a part in uh, keeping Endymion along the traditional mid-city route. That, I know, was very difficult. It was a minute by minute, hour by hour kind of um, assessment. And uh, it is of such importance uh, to the residents and businesses in Mid-City. So we thank them for that. Susan, thank you. Um, That's all right. That's all right. On behalf of the uh, 70,000 uh, people who work in the hospitality industry, I think they can attest for a very, very busy Mardi Gras season. Restaurants were full. As we said earlier, the hotels were full. Retail was busy. And Mardi Gras is not only French Quarter, but it's also along the Uptown route. And visitors saw parts of New Orleans uh, that really shine uh, throughout the time. Uh, those of you who got up early this morning and saw a lot of the checkouts from the hotels also know that the visitors saw a, a clean city, a cleaner city, uh, than the day before when, uh, of course, the parades were passing. And I think that shows that the city is working. And they take those messages back to their friends and family in those towns where they came from. And I think that's very important. Along with the CVB uh, and their great uh, staff on, on media, we hosted media from the UK, from France, Austria, Portugal, Korea, the Netherlands, Canada. The Weather Channel took an act, active interest in our um, activities this weekend. The, uh, the Today Show also uh, mentioning us on, on several occasions. And again, the impressions about the city being a, a welcoming city, a, a great host city, only carries us further into this year as we go into some other great events, including the Super Bowl. So um, the city's working, and the 70,000 uh, workers who uh, work in the hospitality industry I want to thank the city for supporting what they do and for making their jobs a little bit easier. Thank you. Mark, thank you. Just to summarize, you know, again, I want to thank the public. I mean, personal responsibility, common sense, and common courtesy are going to take us a long way uh, in the city, and that makes everybody's job here that much more easy, and, of course, it makes – uh, the possibilities of joy and fun on the streets of New Orleans uh, that much easier. Secondly, to all the uh, to all the crews, you know, who spend their entire year working really, really hard to make this the free show on earth. I thank them as well. I want to make two other comments, and I'm gonna I want to show you this visual. Um, we can make a better one for you, but I want everybody in New Orleans getting focused on the Super Bowl next year. Uh, and while your head is in Mardi Gras, I want you to look at this schedule. This is the first weekend of this is the first weekend of Mardi Gras next year. It's on the uh, 25th and 26th of January. And then there's, there's a Super Bowl in between. Let me say that again. There's the first weekend of Mardi Gras, and then there's the Super Bowl in between. So y'all just went through that 12 days, and it was, there was a haul. This time the Super Bowl is going to be in between. And then there's going to come what we just did this last weekend. And so... The only way that, that the Super Bowl is going to be a success if everybody in the city now really starts to think about the role that they're going to play. Uh, businesses um, and homeowners, businesses primarily cleaning up, uh, making sure that the city is clean. We're going to do our part. Uh, I've created something called the Hospitality Zone. We're going to dovetail uh, with the Super Bowl host committee, and we have already begun our work in earnest. You know, we sent the team to the Super Bowl. We've already had a post-Super Bowl visit, post-mortem meeting to learn what uh, we saw in Indianapolis, we're going to begin working on it, but we have to begin now. And we need thousands of volunteers, uh, and, of course, we need to do Mardi Gras well, and we need to do the Super Bowl well. Uh, as though this year wasn't enough, uh, next year is going to be better. So I show this to you now um, so that everybody can start preparing and thinking about how just spectacular. Uh, and on top of that, I will make the prediction that the Saints will be in the Super Bowl next year, uh, which is going to add a little bit of flavor. Uh, to uh, the joy uh, in the city. Secondly, somebody reminded me yesterday that, um, that uh, you know, Mardi Gras is just a day. Carnival is a season. Uh, and as Carnival begins, Mardi Gras is the last day of Carnival, but it's the first day of Lent. Right? So and Ash Wednesday is the first day uh, of Lent. And as we, as we move into, um, you know, this period of time, uh, uh, as I went to, to church today and got ashes, the archbishop wrote a letter uh, that actually talked about violence uh, in the city of New Orleans and using the next 40 days, uh, irrespective of what faith uh, you belong to uh, or not, to really reflect on violence in the city of New Orleans. 
uh, as joyous as the occasion is that we just had, uh, we continue to um, suffer in a city uh, that uh, for many, 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 many years uh, has had a murder rate that's higher uh, than the national average and call people to really think about what they personally can do uh, to make sure that the city becomes a safe place uh, for all of us and involves so many things and I've talked about this so many, so many times and I won't go into the details today but it is very, very important that we, everybody in the city of New Orleans commit ourselves to having a peaceful and a safe city uh, for our children because uh, as I have said many, many times uh, if you don't feel safe, you really can't be free. Uh, and that is my wish and, and my prayer for uh, the people of the city of New Orleans uh, for today and forever. Uh, but now is a good time to reflect on that as we move into um, this Lenten season. So uh, with that, uh, I thank everybody. Uh, I wish you all well, and um, we'll be happy to answer questions uh, from the media. To whom? Oh, wait, let me get my pen out. <laughs> Okay. Um, we count all the activity we do in arrest actions, which include summonses, curfew, truancies, etc. In the 8th District, for the 11-day carnival season, we had 1,056 arrest actions. Not all of those are people who actually go to the lockup. We give summonses, etc. And that was compared to 562 the year before, or about an 88% increase. So remember, not all of those people actually cross the sheriff's doorway, but they have been taken into detention and given usually a summons in some other ways. Uh, the event last night at Canal and Rampart. Uh, very similar in nature to the event that happened on Irado. Police officers are aware of and hear gunshots. Officers immediately begin engaging in the process. One, responding to render aid. Two, responding to control the scene. Three, responding to look for a perpetrator or perpetrators. Our mounted unit happened to be at the corner of Bourbon and Bienville in between that block when the call came out. And our mounted unit, which uh, <laughs> did a, a tremendous job, actually engaged in pursuit of two young men, uh, one of which who was, ex who was exhibiting behavior of hiding a weapon on his waist. As the mounted unit gave chase, they caught both of these young men. One of them was a 17-year-old, one of them was a 16-year-old. The 16-year-old, um, I'm prohibited from talking about. The 17-year-old was not a stranger to the criminal justice system and in fact had been arrested prior for violent crimes. The two victims, however, received incredibly minor injuries, or any injuries, not minor, uh, not minor, but they received minor injuries. As far as we know, they were treated and released. On that case, we're still investigating it. The 8th District continues to follow up on it. We did recover one weapon. That weapon is not the same caliber as uh, other evidence we found on the scene. We'll continue to investigate. At the Arado and St. Charles incident, same thing. On the other side of St. Charles from the parade route, gunshots ring out. Officers get engaged. They chase a young man. They find him. They find the weapon. I don't know how to say it any clearer. Nobody in this police department said he was being arrested for the shooting. We always said he was arrested for carrying an illegal firearm, and we will continue to investigate if he should be charged with that shooting. We still have another suspect of interest in that particular case. So the minute we know the appropriate charge for him beyond carrying a firearm, we'll tell you. We'll be glad to tell you. Was, uh, no, arrest made in last night's shooting. no, no, we did make one arrest last night. Two arrests. One person for carrying a gun illegally who was an adult and the 16-year-old had a curfew violation, and we continue to investigate what was their relationship before, during, and after the shooting. Mm -hmm. Frank. Just real quick, I'm sorry. A uh, curfew arrest on mm -hmm. part of the total, mm -hmm. 1,000 on part of the total. Yes. No, yes, 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 yes. Right. I don't know. The, I, we'll give it to you when we know. Oh, right, right. Getting, but it was a lot. This at the end of your, sorry, you touched on this at the end of your, your presser here about next year. Um, I know you said you have a team in place, a task force in place. From a law enforcement standpoint, you guys plan on calling in more state troopers or anybody like that? Because obviously, this is a. Is your question related to the Super Bowl? It's related to the Super Bowl. Mardi Gras coincides. Yes. The let me let me let me answer it because there's a technical answer to that question as it relates to the Super Bowl. This Super Bowl is a uh, is a legally designated national security event. 
There are a number of different levels of those. This is the second highest level. So the Department of Homeland Security and the federal level has already been engaged. The Secretary and I had communications over two months ago uh, about this. I traveled to Washington and met with them about it. Subsequent to that, I've had a number of meetings in my office uh, with the folks that are running the Homeland Security. So, so it's going to be a federal, state, and local initiative. We've already begun to make the preparations for a very robust presence um, that is going to be, for those of you that remember 2002, extraordinary is really the only way to say it. As big as what just happened down the street, a Super Bowl is a different kind of thing. And a Super Bowl in 2000, you know, uh, 13 is going to be a bigger thing than you've seen before. And so that planning process has be already begun. Uh, we will be engaged, of course, in terms of total numbers with the state police uh, and, of course, with all federal agencies and all local agencies as well, just on the security side. On the other side of that, uh, we already have a Super Bowl host committee that's set up. It's a fairly robust committee. The honorary chairs of that are James Carville and Mary Matlin. We've been working over a year uh, on that as well. Um, that committee continues to meet. That's got 13 subcommittees. Uh, as I said last week, a couple weeks ago, we had a post-Indianapolis um, you know, meeting to determine what we can learn from that. We've already begun planning. On top of that, uh, I've created something called the Hospitality Zone. Uh, it's just a geographic you know, uh, piece that includes, where are we? Uh, includes the bridge past Marini uh, from the interstate, from the Claiborne Express, all the way back uh, to the river, anything in that. Uh, and anything that any tourist would touch, from the second they walk, they fly into um, the airport, uh, to the roads that they drive on, to the highway, anybody that touches that piece all the way down to the convention center, anybody on the private side, the public side, that's got a, a piece of that real estate is going to be involved in the discussion about a, how to make New Orleans uh, look spectacular uh, and actually perform in a way that um, we think will provide a Super Bowl that's second to none. So those things are in process. I will say this. The one thing Indianapolis did that uh, was really stood out for them, uh, according to Roger Goodell, uh, who I spoke to, was customer service. Uh, and I told him I thought we had that part. Um, but having said that, uh, we can always be really better than we always are about welcoming people here. And the thing that made that customer service so wonderful was the thousands, and I'm talking like 7,500 to 10,000, right, Mark? Was that the number? Um, citizens that lived in Indianapolis that volunteered to assist with moving all of the people that came in town. And we're going to be calling on the citizens of New Orleans and in the metropolitan area themselves to create a robust volunteer service so that we can supplement uh, the public employees as well. This is a very big lift. It's something that we've done more than anybody else, I think, except Miami. Um, but again, the, the level has gotten much higher uh, and the expectations are much greater. I have no doubt that we'll perform really, really well, but this is another situation where it's going to require everybody uh, that lives here to help the city shine again. So uh, I reach out to everybody. We'll have more formal you know, press conferences to discuss the specifics as we go on, but we're already well in our preparations and we'll have more information coming. Yes. Together for uh, the mayor or the chief, it, uh, it's an issue we heard complaints about from both sides. It involves uh, structures, tents, uh, grills, and then the ground. Um, from I guess Calliope to Tripsicore, uh, we were told that the police uh, t made people take down tents and, and grills and things like that. And then on the flip side, further uptown, uh, where they were still left in place, a lot of people were complaining of the clutter. It was just too much. It was too crowded, yeah. especially for Baca Sunday night. What's kind of the, the rule? If you can this is, this, is a, this is a moving target, obviously. Uh, and again, when you're trying to manage that many people, and I'll, I'll say this, and I guess I'll just say this every day, common sense, common courtesy alleviates the need to have an intervention and take a police officer that otherwise needs his eyes on who's got a gun away from settling disputes between people that common courtesy should normally settle. You can try to legislate it as much as you can, but if we have our law enforcement folks negotiating real estate disputes, it makes things a little bit complicated. Uh, and there is no one-size-fits-all, so officers have to use that discretion given the circumstances they find. So it would not be unusual to find an officer make a decision on Arlene's Avenue for Endymion given those circumstances than an officer on St. Charles Avenue. One of the things I guess that we should do um, is spend a little time having a public discussion about how much is too much and really what does no sofa mean, <laughs> right? I mean, don't bring a refrigerator means don't bring a refrigerator. 
don't rope something off means don't rope something off. Um, and so, you know, I can imagine that it's very, very difficult for, you know, the men and women of the NOPD to negotiate those specific things to a T so that it is perfectly uniform. Um, I think they did a fairly, you know, good job this year. There are always going to be some complaints. You know, when you say Mardi Gras was perfect, you know, it wasn't perfect for the family that got boxed out because their neighbor was doing something that they shouldn't have done, and you can't always guarantee that. But again, you have to leave it up to the citizens. What we will try to do is spend some time uh, this year because we had some trouble last year with the with the fires, you know, and, and the grills on, on and Demi to really have a public discussion about really what, what, what are the limits and, and how can we legislate so that people kind of pay attention to common sense. Um, you know, but again, as much as you try to regulate stuff, I always come back, you know, to common sense, common courtesy, and common safety. That will take, that will take care of about 99%. There's always going to be a knucklehead that's going to try to get in your grill. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> okay, and that's going to cause a problem. And I don't, I've never seen anybody be able to legislate, you know, against stupidity. And so we just deal with that uh, when we do. Chief, if you think you can add something to that, I'll let no, you no, try. Yes, we together, bro. I'd like to add to that because the one thing that was emphasized this year, which was very overdue, were not so much who was taking whoever's real estate, so to speak. It was who was in the uh, neutral, who was in the uh, driveway of the neutral ground, who was in the cross streets to block traffic. That was the big emphasis that we did this year, that the mayor did, that the police and fire and, and did all the way up the avenue, get out of the intersections. That's public safety. That's, that is safety. Fighting over each other's territory is something we can't, ha I mean, maybe we can't eventually handle it all. But that was not the emphasis like the intersections were. That was very, very well done because I had a lot of calls from a lot of people I had checking on it. Yeah, just one rule. Just treat your neighbor like you want him to treat you. Then <laughs> everything's good. Um, but we will, we, we ought to, we're going to spend some time and we should create a portal for having a public discussion about, you know, exactly what it is. But again, you can't be too exact because you're dealing with a, you know, as we say, a moving, a moving picture. Anybody else? All right. Thank you all. Sorry, sorry. Superintendent Surpass, it occurred to you, how do you think that that helps um, in the Washington District in terms of fighting? You can answer that too. You know, we, find, we, um, we have always believed that curfew is a tool to help us protect children, to help them not hurt other people. And as a result of that, our officers take that tool seriously. As you know, in 2011, we had over a 20 percent increase in the use of curfew detentions, over 10, and that was before the additional hours of curfew were added in the quarter. Uh, having spent a lot of my life working in the French Quarter as a police officer and a supervisor, curfew is important there because it is an adult entertainment area. And as you get later into the evening, there's even less reason for young children to be out there. So I'm proud of the team that found about 28 percent of all curfew detentions in this year had to do with the new curfew hours. Um, yeah. And w are you hey, the sports me, guy or the news guy today? On one second. Wait. Let, let, I want Colonel Edmondson to re respond to the curfew piece. Tremendous, tremendous additional tool in our tool chest. Uh, the ability for a state troop, we bring them in, um, they can't identify someone as far as their age, we can now take them to the 8th District and, and they handle them from that point. We're removing from the street, we're removing a possibility of something happen. We're seeing that age group carries guns, carries weapons. So the ability to remove that was a tool in our toolbox that, that played heavily on our, on our success this year. And I'll, and I'll end with this. Um, it was quite an experience to move through the French Quarter last night at 12 o'clock. I had never done that before. Uh, and for any parent, you know, who would do that, 16-year-olds don't need to be in the French Quarter after hours. I mean, that's just a, that, that, that is so just patently obvious and, and common sense that it's harmful to them, you know, and it can be harmful to them, you know, for that to happen. So from my perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense um, and, you know, we will enforce it even handily and make it right. But uh, anybody who drives down, you know, in that area, there's different kinds of entertainment in the city. And, uh, and French Quarter is for one thing, and, you know, the other parts of this city are for another thing. So I think it's, it's meeting with great success, and I think they're handling it well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See another good day.